Hello, my friends, and welcome to another Robcast. And this one is called Weak is the New Strong. And you know I love titles. You know I love a good, it's like a spiritual craft, the art of titling. But this one, Weak is the New Strong, I gotta be honest, I really like it. I really, raise your glasses, so good. Weak is the New Strong. And uh, I actually, I just wanna do, a, I'm gonna do a sermon. This is going to be an old school sermon on a passage from the New Testament about weakness and strength and really about wisdom, about alternative wisdom, because we're always surrounded by tribes and systems that tell us the world works a particular way. And one of the reasons why I think it's so important to talk about alternative wisdom is it's so easy to get caught up in a particular way of seeing things that you, you stop even questioning it. You just accept it as that's how it is. But the power of alternative wisdom is it helps you begin to poke holes in the dominant thinking because you've come to see there's a whole nother way uh, to live. And, uh, oh yeah, speaking of that sort of thing. I have a new book coming out. It comes out a, a month from when this episode is released. And the book is called, What is the Bible? Uh, que es la Biblia? And uh, the subtitle is, How an Ancient Library of Poems, Letters, and Stories Can Transform the Way You Think and Feel About Everything. And I just recorded the audiobook for those of you who would prefer to hear it then read it, and it took like two days. It's really long, the audiobook is. And um, you can pre-order the book and get bonus content that's not in the book at robbell.com. And then you can also go there for information. I'm going to do, uh, right around the release of the book, um, a couple of bookstores, a, a, a bookstore tour. So Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Seattle, Portland, Denver, Minneapolis, and Ohio, um, I will be coming to your fine locales to uh, talk about the book and to see you all. So that's always, um, that's always just pure joy for me. So um, this passage, this idea, this week is the new strong idea, it's been working on me for uh, well over a decade. It's one of those things that, that grabs a hold of you and it starts to do something to you. And yet you know that you're just scratching the surface. You know it's just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm going to give you some ideas here. And I'm going to read you just a couple of texts. And text meaning like sacred texts, meaning passages not like texts, like I'll meet you at seven, the other kind of text. Um, and it's all, it, this passage is found in, uh, it's 1 Corinthians which is a letter in the New Testament, which is different than two Corinthians. <laughs> that was a Trump joke. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and it's this a man named Paul, and he's writing to his friends in the city of Corinth. And he talks to them about wisdom. And he talks about the Christ who's crucified, which... Uh, it's important to understand in the first century, which we've sort of lost that by now in, in our vernacular, but to speak of a Christ that was crucified was to speak of a Savior who failed. Essentially, that's what that language would have meant, because crucifixion was something that happened to people who were enemies of the state. So there's this massive military superpower, the Roman Empire, and if the Roman Empire deemed you a threat to the peace of the empire, deemed you an enemy of the state, you were crucified. So Christ, which would have been understood to mean um, like a savior, uh, one who comes to redeem, um, one who's been set apart to do something really powerful, supernatural, however you want to see it. So uh, a Christ who was crucified would have been like a, beyond a paradox. It just would have been nonsense. And so he centers everything around this idea. Now, what you and I have looked at uh, the past little while that Jesus comes to take us, to invite us, to welcome us into a new way of living, uh, a new mode of being, a way of third way nonviolence. 
And so for the Romans, if you uh, rebelled, if you resisted, you were crucified. It was peace, but it was peace because all the opponents, all the resistance had simply been wiped out, had been slaughtered. And so Jesus comes to offer a new nonviolent way of being in the world, um, to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to forgive those who wrong you and to love your enemies. So he comes offering a new way of being, essentially raising this question, who is Lord, Caesar or Jesus? Who's actually making a better world? And the Jesus story is about the Jesus who, the Christ who was crucified, which he goes to his death in nonviolence, better to die in love than to keep living in the same patterns of violence and vengeance that human beings have been trapped in for thousands of years. Are you with me now? You see what this is about. So his death would look like loss and failure. This guy was a Messiah who, who lost, he failed. Unless you see it as a question of modes of being. Um, is there a new way to be human? Or do we as human beings have to live trapped in the same old cycles of violence? Is the world made better through coercive military violence? Or is the world made better through sacrificial love? So this was the question in the first century, it's the question now. Um, do we have to live in the non-imaginative, same old boring, you bomb us, we bomb you, um, you say horrible things about me, I say horrible things about you in return. Do we have to live in those same cycles or could we break out of them and be set free? Is the world made better through getting revenge on your enemies or through love? And so what Paul does is he sets up this fantastic idea of the Christ crucified and the wisdom that is present there that if you're still stuck in the dominant patterns of thinking, you're going to miss. You're going to just stay with the old point score game, which is he died, he lost, they killed him, they won, the same old thing. So he talks about this, and then he has this great line where he says to these people living in Corinth, he says to them, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. And by the way, there's another translation. I have multiple translations, actual paper books, paper Bibles, pages here. Um, so he has this line in 1 Corinthians 1, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Um, and then there's one translation called the message where he, t he translates it, take a good look friends at who you were when you got called into this life. So there's this idea, when you woke up, when you began to see things in a new way, when you began to orient your life around another way of acting and behaving and living and breathing, when you began, uh, I think we would pro we'd probably say, when you began to wake up, he says, think about who you were. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. How great is that line? God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you are in the Christ who has become for us wisdom from God. And then he's just getting warmed up at that point. But there's so much there I got to stop because it's, oh, my word. It's so good. So I would start by saying this. Think about the moments in your life that have most shaped you. Think about the moments that have most helped you see how it really works, what really matters. I would imagine if you're like me, if I were to name the four or five events that have most altered the trajectory of my life, who have most helped me understand what really matters and what doesn't, how it actually works, that a good chunk of those moments, a good percentage of them are about loss, 
pain, failure, embarrassment, shame, humiliation? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, or, and I know all of my friends listening, all of you who are, who are in recovery, who are celebrating another day clean and sober, another day, one day at a time. You, you know exactly, and by the way, I'm sending you all kinds of love and grace and peace. Now, you know what I'm talking about. It's like you hit the wall. Um, you came to the end of yourself. You were ready to acknowledge and admit that your life had become unmanageable. And it's at the end of ourselves when our plans blow up in our face, when we have no more power or strength or ideas. That's when we are open to power, force, and strength beyond ourselves. It's when we acknowledge our need and we cry out that all kinds of new things can then happen. Things die, but things can be born. So you think about how many times it was your own weakness that actually was like the ground in which all these new things got planted. Your own weakness had a, sort, a certain sort of strength in it. It's us acknowledging our desperate need that opens us up to grace, power, and strength beyond us. And so what he says here in this passage is he says to them, think about when you first began to understand this Christ wisdom, this upside down wisdom. He says, think about you, you weren't, you weren't wealthy. You weren't anybody um, noted. You weren't famous. You didn't have noble birth. You didn't have lots of money. He says to this ragtag, and by the way, some of the people who he would have been talking to would have been actual slaves or former slaves. So he's talking to people, and in the first century culture, which was incredibly striated hierarchical, everybody knew where they were in ranking in relation to everybody else, <laughs> kind of like our world. But in the first century world, you had Romans, Greeks, Jews, male, female, slave, free. You had very, very strong class boundaries. And essentially, this upside-down Christ movement, this nonviolent explosion of love movement caught on among all kinds of people, but many of the people were slaves, former slaves. And he says, by the way, it's because the losers often get it first. Are you with me on this? It's when the system hasn't rewarded you that you're the most open to another kind of system. Uh, it's, it's those who oftentimes it's the people who aren't the most popular, who most understand the power of a message that's inclusive for everybody who's been kicked to the edges. Oftentimes it's those who've been marginalized and excluded that are the first to understand the power of a message that loves and embraces and welcomes everybody who hasn't been included. Do you see how that works? If the system is working for you and you're climbing the ladder, then a, a wisdom that challenges the ladder and the system isn't going to make as much sense to you. It's going to sound upside down. It's going to sound like Christ crucified. Uh, but if the system has put its boot on your neck, if uh, you haven't flourished with great success and fame in a system that says that's what matters, then you're going to be more likely to understand the power of a message that's for everybody who hasn't earned those things or who isn't playing that game. And so he essentially says to them, you, you aren't at the very top of, of this world. And yet you came to understand the power of this new way of being, this new Christ wisdom. And isn't that like the mystery of God, to use the weak things and the things that are not, to use the events in our life that look like complete train wrecks to teach us and shape us? There's a divine mystery that goes to work in our leastness, our lowness, our lostness. That's how the divine mystery works. That's how the divine love works. Exactly the moment 
in which we feel most unworthy, we're reminded that that's not how it worked in the first place. And exactly the moment when we feel most unloved is when we come, we're more likely to understand a message that insists that was never how it worked. So there are these dominant energies of our world. There were these dominant energies of the first century world, which are very similar. There are these dominant energies that essentially fuel the world. Do any of these sound familiar? Ranking, grasping, climbing, clinging, winning, propping up, tearing down. There are these dominant energies that are so easy to be caught up in because they're how, in many ways, the dominant systems that we are a part of works. And so it's in relation to each other. Do you know that sense when you find yourself comparing yourself to others? And it's not just that you have enough, it's that somebody else stumbles, they trips up, they, they say something stupid, they fail, they, have a, they encounter something, and something about it just bolsters your own sense of, oh, good, I'm okay, because at least I didn't have that happen to me. That sense of constantly gauging, that inner dialogue that's always measuring, what does she have? Um, how is she doing? Is she able to handle it? Because I'm not handling it. Oh, good, she's not handling it. Oh, good, now I feel better. How much of our worth and our sense of unworthiness is rooted in ranking, grasping, clinging, winning, propping up, tearing others down, self-righteousness at the expense of others. And so the, so the Christ crucified wisdom is about the Christ who dies as an enemy of the state. The worst possible thing that could happen in a ranking system would be to deem, be deemed an enemy of the system, to, to be actually ex ex executed for losing. And so here's what Paul is doing in this passage. Here is the alternative wisdom that if this, if this takes root in you, and remember the great mysteries are, are often like yeast and seeds. They get planted and then they grow over time. So, so the, the ways that actually transform us, they generally come in, sometimes they come in like a brick to the head, but oftentimes they come in a bit more subtle. Something gets planted and it starts to grow and gradually it takes over. And now once you see, you can't unsee. Once you taste, you can't untaste. But essentially here, here's, here's what Paul is saying. Here, here's the like, the gold. He essentially is saying God isn't playing that game. The divine isn't playing the grasping, clinging, winning game. It doesn't work like that with love. So all of the ways that we think we are bolstering our case, making our case for how good we are, making our case our point for how worthy we are, none of that point earning and scorekeeping was actually earning you the thing that you thought it was earning you because God isn't playing that game. By the way, imagine if there was a public figure who every time he or she had a microphone, they talked about how great they were, essentially making their case for how worthy, what a winner they were. Imagine that. Um, imagine how after a while that would get so old because you'd be like, what are they trying to prove? And essentially what Paul is saying here is that whole game where you are endlessly making sure that you've shored up your own status, making sure that you have shown everybody that you are worthy, that you measure up. He says that whole game, God isn't playing that game. And by the way, if God was playing that game, if there was an infinite presence to the universe, would it really be impressed by you? <laughs> if, the, if there was a source of all diversity and creativity, would it be like, oh, really? You planted some new flowers in your front yard. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> if, if there was infinite ground of being that was 
boundless, boundaryless love? Would it be like, oh, you said something nice to somebody. Well done. That's so impressive. <laughs> what a joke, right? There's essentially some humor here. He's essentially saying, when you, and so then he points to the system and he says, uh, the Romans who have this very strong sense of ranking, so much so that this Jesus who comes in love is executed as a threat to the state. Do you think that all that power is actually that impressive? Do you really think if there is an infinite power that, that holds the universe together, it's like, ooh, you can crucify someone. Wow, we'll have to rethink the whole thing. So, so there's an element of spoof and parody here in which he simply says, God isn't playing that game because all things look ridiculous in light of that kind of infinite depth and power. And so the invitation is to give up the game. The invitation is to give up the earning points, propping up the ego game. The invitation is to give up the endless obsession with feeling worthy, with being good enough. By the way, when Moses is first interacting with the divine and, and the divine says, oh, you want my name? I am. I am. Yeah. And how's that for a name? Being itself. Being itself. This should tell us something. You're here. You're breathing. You, listening to this Robcast, you are here. So when people talk about, do you, do you believe there are absolutes? Yes. Being itself. You're here and you are able to sense and you are able to perceive and you are a presence. You have some element of soul to you, spirit. And that's miraculous and wonderful and enough. You're here. So you exist in like a field of love. It's like, a, like in quantum physics, they talk about being entangled. They talk about fields. Y you, you are, you're here. And that's miraculous and wonderful and good enough. By the way, I have this friend who's a meditation teacher. And uh, we were at a party one time and I was asking her, because she sees all kinds of people who come to her for spiritual guidance and to meditate with her. And I said to her, I was asking her all these questions about her work and her practice and I said, if there's one thing that everybody who came to you could get that would change everything, what's the one thing you end up saying again and again and again and again that if everybody could get it, then you would have less people coming to you? And she was like, oh, I know what it is. She said, you are enough. That's what she said. She said, that's what, what I do with my work most of the time as I'm telling people, you're enough. Most people, she said, come to me because they don't feel like they're enough, like they're good enough, worthy enough, smart enough, moral, and whatever it is enough, that they're deeply at the center of their being, they're lacking something, they're missing it. And she says, if everybody could understand that they're enough, it would change everything. Yeah, yeah. And so... What Paul is essentially saying is that the divine isn't playing that game. The divine isn't playing the, are you worthy enough? Are you smart enough? Are you good enough? And so in your weakness is actually where you find your strength. It is whatever the system you are caught in and however it measures and ranks and tells you, this is what you have to do to be enough it is you dying to that, those rules, to that system, to that consciousness, to that wisdom. It is in your death to that and in your weakness and in your losing and in your failure that you come in to your strength because weak is the new strong. Jesus tells the story, two men go up to the temple to pray. The one man prays the temple, basically, thank you, God, that I'm not like this loser over here. And the other guy prays, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus essentially says, the one man gets it <laughs> in our language. He says, essentially, the one man, he's tuned in. The way that Jesus says it is the one man goes home justified. It's the one who understands that my weakness, that my crying out 
that all the ways that I don't measure up, that's actually where the life is. Or I love this, uh, I love this line Jesus has in the Gospel of John. He says, the dead hear my voice. Yeah, the dead. It's everybody who's stopped playing the game. They're the ones who get it. Everyone who comes to realize that trying to earn what you've already had doesn't work. Those are the ones, the dead. Those are the ones, the people who've died to all that. The ones that are still grasping, clinging, proving, the ones at the party letting you know all of their important accomplishments, the ones still ranking and comparing, they're, they're the ones who still haven't tapped in. They still haven't woken up, but the dead, they hear my voice. Yeah. Or I love this story of, of the, these two sons. Jesus tells a story of a prodigal son, wanders away, spends all the money, comes home. Father welcomes him home. The older brother is furious that he's been welcomed home. The story is about how they've both been the father's sons the whole time. The one thinks that it's his bad deeds and his wandering away that have separated him from the father. The other thinks that his goodness has earned him something with the father, thinks that he stayed home and was the good, hardworking son, the moral one. So he assumes that that's somehow gotten him extra points. And Jesus tells a story about a father who isn't playing that game. Neither the good deeds or the bad deeds were either getting them less points or more points because the father was never playing the point game because the father was like, you're both my boys. You've been my boys the whole time. You'll always be my boys. So the weak is the new strong is the invitation to give up the game because it's so exhausting. It's so exhausting. Everywhere you go, comparing, ranking, trying to muster up this inner strength that I know I'm good enough, I'm good enough. And you get to just let go of it all. Everything is rigged to prove your worthiness or unworthiness. When all of it has been a gift the whole time. You see it with the inner voice, the critical, harsh, judgmental inner voice telling us, beating us up on the inside or inflating the ego by telling us how great we are. You see it with people and their kids. How many people are working this all out with their kids? Are my kids smart enough? Are my kids going to be successful? Where are they going to school? Do they measure up? How do they rank? Uh, it's just exhausting. Come on, admit it. It's exhausting. If you right now are stressing about your kids, I invite you into your weakness. There's a bunch of things you can't control. If you're stressed about your career, if you're burdened with your goodness, smartness, intelligence, success, weak is the new strong. Yeah, weak is the new strong. And by the way, religion has played into the game as well as anybody, let's be honest. How much of religion has often been clinging to rightness, clinging to doctrine, clinging to orthodoxy, or in clinging to a sense of enlightenedness? Have you ever met somebody who is so eager to show you how enlightened they are and you realize, oh, them feeling like they're enlightened is just a whole nother game they're playing. They just traded games. They traded one fundamentalism for another. Or obviously now you have the, the progressives who cling to progressive as a whole, it's a whole new game to play. Uh, do you get it? Are you with it? Are you about the future? And it's, it's, the, it's, the whole, it's the whole propping ourselves up. It's playing the game just at a different level with different language, different in buzzwords, but it's all the same game. The invitation is to embrace your weakness, all the ways you don't measure up, all the ways you made a mess of things all those moments of failure and loss and not having it together. When you realize that weak is the new strong then they become explosions of grace. Yeah. Uh, to be personal here. Uh, so when I have a book come out, then I start doing, I do interviews for a while about the book. And so I've started doing interviews about six weeks before, about two months, six weeks before a book comes out, I start doing interviews and um, this thing happens where I do an interview and then for the next 24 hours, I replay the interview and all the things I should have said differently 
all the ways I could have been more clear, more articulate, all that. You know what I'm talking about. I wish I could have said that in less words. I should have been more succinct. Oh, I rambled on that. Oh, if that's in print, I'll look like a knucklehead. <laughs> I have this, I'd like this internal dialogue. Because uh, we all want to appear smart. We want to appear wise. We want to drop truth bombs. Uh, we want to be eloquent and articulate. We want to wax poetic about things. We want to take controversial, complicated topics, and we want to be able to talk about them so simply with all this wisdom. I have all these things in my head, and then I do an interview, and I'm like, gah, what was I thinking? Now, obviously, if you do this for a month, you know, I'll think about it, and I'll work on it, and hopefully I'll get better, but nevertheless, weak is the new strong. It's exactly at the moment where I'm like, ah. Oh, Man, what was I thinking? I'm no good at this. I should have said that exactly when I'm weak. I find myself crying out. Ah, uh, help me. <laughs> yeah, help me. Ah, I need grace. I need comfort. I need healing. Yeah, I need a fresh reminder that I'm okay. That it's, it's just a book. It's just an interview. It's just a whatever. It's just a podcast. It's just, I've made this into some referendum on my worthiness. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You turn whatever it is into like a vote. It's like the super council has met <laughs> to decide whether or not you measure up today. Uh, did you get your kids off to school in time with all the right things, all the right things packed? Did they all look Great. Did anybody have any stains on the front of the show? Oh, okay, good. So today I am, today I measure up. Oh, right. At work, every email, I knew how to respond. Every interaction, I handled it. I was able to speak truth to power. I was clear. Oh, good. Then today, I guess I measure. You know what I'm talking about. We play this game endlessly. Yeah. And what we're invited into is an alternate wisdom that understands that weak is the new strong. It doesn't mean that we don't give our best. It doesn't mean that we don't pursue excellence. It doesn't mean that we don't work this craft. It doesn't mean that we don't study and work incredibly hard and throw ourselves into it. But at the deepest level of our being, we understand that there's a whole new power and force at work that flows through us, particularly in our moments of weakness, that we don't have to be the ultimate. We don't have to be the strongest. We don't have to be source we receive from source, that it's a gift that we are the recipients of, and it's been a gift the whole time, that we've been a son, we've been a daughter of the divine the whole time. Yeah, being itself, that's the absolute, that's the miracle. And so in the first century and in now, Christ crucified, that's an upside down way of seeing everything. Really? Failure? That's how the divine works? Foolishness? The divine makes normal wisdom look so empty. Yep, yep. The divine works in the most mysterious of events in our leastness, lostness, lowness. Yep. We should be tuned in then to the failures, to the stumbling, to the mistakes, to the train wrecks, because that's often where the divine's at work. Yes, yes, yes. Because for many, it's all about the endless climb. So all it is, is does this help move things up and to the right? Does this shinier, happier, more polished? And yet the divine works in the bruises, in the cracks, in the pain, in the terror, in the shame, in the addiction, in the moments when you're on the tile floor at 3 a.m., in the moments when you're driving home thinking, I think I just made a mess of that. That's where you're met by the divine that says, hey, I was never playing that game in the first place. Weak is the new strong. All those things that we thought were making the case for how worthy and wonderful and, and that we measured up to love, all those things that we thought were making us worthy were actually working against us because we belonged the whole time. And so as this man Paul writes to his friends, think of you when you first began to wake up to this. 
Was it because you're great? Because it was you're so awesome? It's because you're so wealthy and so noble and so famous and so accomplished? No, no, no. You woke up to this in your weakness. That was the door. That was the door that you walked through. Yeah, yeah. It was in your leastness and your failure. That's where you began to understand a whole new way to see everything. Because weak, my brothers and sisters, is the new strong. Grace and peace be with you.